Let's ask a harder question about comparing fractions, where this time I want to compare fractions with one-third. I want to know what is the biggest fraction which is less than one-third but whose numerator and denominator are both positive integers less than 100. Again, remember that less than means that they cannot be equal to. If you try to use the kind of method that you could use for a simpler fraction like one half, you would do this. Let's think about denominators. Well, could I do anything with something divided by one? No, because I need to be less than one third and I need positive integers. My smallest positive integer is 1, and that is already too big. And actually, the same thing will happen to you. I'll write, this is too big, as is the other options of saying something divided by 2 with the smallest positive integer, and even something divided by 3 with the smallest positive integer, because that is 1 third it starts to become interesting when you do something over 4. Now I want something which is less than one-third. A way to think about this is I could try to think about what happens if I try to divide 4 into 3 parts. In some sense, I could do that with mixed numbers. If I could take 1 and one-third and write it like this, which is not how you usually write a fraction. This would be a third, because if I take three of one and one third, I would get three of the ones plus three of the one thirds. And the three one thirds give me another one. So that would be equal to one third. But I'm not allowed to do that because my numerator has to be an integer. So, if I wanted to do something divided by 4, I would have to use 1 quarter, which is the biggest integer that does not reach 1 and 1 third. What if I want a denominator of 5? This way of thinking is actually very useful for noticing another pattern. How would I get one-third with five? It actually has a beautiful pattern that follows this idea of the one and one-third. If I wanted to take five things and divide into three parts, well, I could use a one full thing and give one full thing to each of the three people that I'm giving things to. That uses up three so far, and I have two left over to share among the three people. That's why one and two-thirds works. If you want to check this for yourself, you can also see that if I took the one and two-thirds, and I took three of them, I would get three of the ones, but I would also get three of the two-thirds and three of the two-thirds would give me two. It's two-thirds of three. So altogether, I would get five. So that's also true. So that means that the biggest fraction I can use, that is, with a denominator of five, for which it's less than one-third, is again one. What happens with sixths? This one's a lot easier. Something equals one-third which is something divided by 6, and that is 2. So that means that the biggest fraction I can use with 6 is 1 sixth. I need to have an integer which is not, which is less than the 2. Do you see a pattern already about how I can get 1 thirds? If I look over here, I have 1 and 1 third, 1 and 2 thirds, 2. I just keep adding 1 third to the numerator every time, that I add 1 to the denominator. This makes sense, because if I want to have 
the numerator to always be one-third of the denominator, if I get one more on the denominator, I should get one-third more in the numerator. This lets me write down a different sequence. Let me write down a whole bunch of numbers that are equal to one-third. One and one-third fourths, one and two-thirds fifths, two sixths, two and one-third sevenths, two and two-thirds eighths, three ninths, three and one-third tenths. This is, by the way, not how you usually write fractions in school. But part of why I'm talking about this is to show how sometimes you can think about things with concepts that are even deeper than what you may have learned when you do problems. But this kind of thinking lets me see right away what fractions have integer numerators that are less than one-third. Because now, if I want to be less than one-third, I know that I need to be less than the number on top, the numerator. And over 7, that's where I can go to 2. Over 8, the largest integer less than 2 and 2 thirds is 2. Over 9, the largest integer less than 3 is 2. Over 10, the largest integer less than 3 and 1 third is 3. Do you see another pattern here? I have from 1, 1, 1 to 2, 2, 2 to 3. I wonder if the same number repeats three times on the top before it gets bigger. Again, that also makes sense because the top is increasing by one third every time the bottom increases by one. Here we're actually also thinking about a mathematical concept called ratios, where we think about how fast something increases compared to something else. We'll talk much more about that in another class. But what this is telling me is that I need to compare all of these fractions. If you use the method of comparing by denominators, actually, I would need to think about three cases. And the three cases would depend on whether the denominator had a remainder of 1, 2, or 0 when I divide by 3. But I want to use the pattern I just showed you to find another way to do this. You see, I will see three of the numbers before I see them increase. Let me write the whole list again. I have one-fourth, one-fifth, one-sixth, two-sevenths, two-eighths, two-ninths, three-tenths, three-elevenths, three-twelfths, four-thirteenths, four-fourteenths, four-fifteenths, and it keeps going. I want to know which of these is the biggest? These are all numbers which are less than one-third. Now I wrote them in rows so you can compare them inside each row. Look at the first row. I have the same one being divided into four parts, five parts, or six parts. Which of those is the biggest? It's when you have the fewest parts to divide it into. So, the biggest number in the first row is one quarter. How about the second row? I will take two parts, but they are either out of a pie that's been divided into seven parts, eight parts, or nine parts. So the most would be to take the two out of the seven parts. And the same happens for every single row. So now I'm comparing which is the biggest? One-fourth, two-sevenths, three-tenths, four-thirteenths, all the way down. And how do these look towards the end? Towards the end, I need to actually remember what is happening when I take my denominators and they get very close to 100. I will write that row 
on the right hand side. Look at the right column. These are all multiples of 3. 99 is divisible by 3. 99 is divisible by 3. In fact, 99 divided by 3 is 33. Since I can't be all the way to 1 third, I would have 32 here. If you see the pattern, every number is if I divide the denominator by 3 and subtract 1 on the right column. And that would be the right column. 32 over 98, 32 over 97. And the largest fraction of those is the 32 over 97. And so all I have to do now is to compare all of the purple fractions. 1 quarter, 2 sevenths, 3 tenths, 4 over 13, all the way to 32 over 97. There's a very important point I already want to say. You might have thought that the answer to this question would be to use the denominator of 99, because maybe you have thought that the way to get the biggest fractions you can is with these biggest denominators. Already we see that's not the answer, because 32 over 97 is better. Now I just know that I have to compare all of these purple fractions. Let's remember where the purple fractions came from, though. It does have something to do with threes. Looking back at this picture, where were those, where were those purple fractions? Here, and here, and here. Now, look at the numbers that were right above them. The numbers that were right above them all had a one-third. That's actually telling me something about how I got to them. You see, the way I got to the first one quarter is I started by taking one and one-third quarters and subtracting one-third quarter. And by the way, the first thing is one-third. So this is telling me right away that this is what you have if you take a quarter of a third, which when you multiply fractions or divide fractions is one-twelfth. How about the second one? The second one is coming when I started from two and one-third, sevenths, minus one-third sevenths, which is the one-third which we had before minus one divided by 21. So if you see what's happening, the 12 is three times the four because of this one-third. The 21 is three times the seven because of this one-third. So for this whole sequence of fractions, how much less than one-third are they? They are less than one divided by a number, which is three times their denominator. So if I write this again, for this sequence of fractions that I have, one-fourth is equal to one-third minus one-twelfth. Two-sevenths is equal to one-third minus one over three times seven, which is twenty-one. Three-tenths is one-third minus one over three times ten, which is thirty. And this goes all the way until the last thirty-two over ninety-seven, which is equal to one-third minus one over some number, which is three times ninety-seven. Why don't I calculate it? Because I don't need to. I need to know which of these is the biggest. And the biggest is when I subtract the least from one-third. If I want to subtract the least, I want the biggest denominator. And so that's how I know that the answer to this whole question is 32 over 97. I wanted to do this question in a different way than I did the question of largest fraction, which is less than one-half 
whose numerator and denominator are less than 100. I very carefully chose a different way because I wanted to show that when you do a math problem, there can be many ways of doing it. Last time, we may have looked at the denominator. This time, we looked at the numerator. If we had done everything with the denominator this time, we would have had too many cases because of all these different one-third, two-thirds, and no leftover on top. And the value of being able to do a question in many ways is that sometimes there's a better way. And lastly, with this whole way of thinking, I wanted to get you used to thinking about numbers in a way that isn't just used for doing problems. For example, here, I wrote a mixed number divided by 7. You understand what that means. That just means 2 plus 1 third divided by 7. You don't usually write that as your answer because it's not a nice answer. But sometimes the process uses these things which are not as nice. And so this time, we have used a way of thinking with more creativity to answer a harder question where I needed to use one-third instead of one-half.